Inspired by the success of artists like Gordon Lightfoot, Anne Murray, and Joni Mitchell, a new wave of troubadours emerges, writing songs about love, loneliness, and the land. While rock rules at the dawn of the Woodstock era, a new wave of singer-songwriters finds an audience waiting for them. They don't all plug in like Dylan, but these artists electrify listeners with their highly personal songs about a wide, cold country. Songs that resonate around the world. Coming from the prairies, a pair of artists will grow to become two of the country's most beloved musical icons. Joni Mitchell and Neil Young write timeless songs that reflect the beauty of Canada's natural landscape. They'll move on to become influential players in rock, jazz, pop, and punk. And although they will both move south to pursue their careers, they are forever quintessential Canadian artists. Their solo performances on stages around the world will have the power to hold audiences spellbound for decades to come. I met Neil like not formally. He had a band called The Squires, and as Neil got better and better, and we got better and better, and started to make records, first at our radio stations, then at real recording studios, we'd play each other our latest records. The Squires became four to go, essentially, and it was Neil's band from, from Winnipeg. In 1964, at age 16, Rick James joined the Naval Reserves to avoid the draft, but he says he wasn't cut out for military life. After a year of service, Rick went AWOL. I went to Canada and stayed there for AWOL from the Navy for about two and a half years, which is, was great because that's when my musical career really got underway. After fleeing to Canada in 1965, Rick started a band called the Minor Birds. It included future members of the group Steppenwolf and an up-and-coming singer-songwriter named Neil Young. Music is really colorblind. Rick and Neil headed to Detroit to make it big. The band signed a record deal with Motown and recorded several songs, including the Minor Bird Hop. This rare recording is the only evidence of this once promising band. Just as they were about to release their first single, Rick and Neil fired their manager. In retaliation, he informed Motown that Rick was wanted by the military. I remember me and Neil in our apartment, and we were sitting down that, that night. Motown stopped the deal because they knew I was AWOL. After their manager blew the whistle, Motown shelved the project. It was a devastating time for Rick and Neil. Well, Neil, Neil became quite restless because he wasn't performing enough. One day he left. He sensibly and wisely got in the hearse and made tracks for the West Coast. The first time I saw Neil, I was uh, going across Canada on this tour with this little folk group, and uh, he was doing exactly what I wanted to do when I got back, was to get a great rhythm section and play folk songs on an electric guitar. Every time you touch her. We drove down to Los Angeles in a 53 Pontiac hearse, and we're in traffic, and I guess uh, still saw us. So he ran up to us and got us and, and pulled over. Neil Young teamed up with Stephen Stills in 1966 to form one of the greatest California rock bands, Buffalo Springfield. There's something happening here. But what it is ain't exactly clear. The Springfield found immediate success, but conflicts between the two stars, Stills and Young, combined with Young's desire for a solo career, caused tension from the start. Stills said later that he wanted to be in the Beatles, and Neil wanted to be Bob Dylan. The relationship was a bunch of 19 and 20 year old guys just getting something together for the first time in the spotlight of, you know, interviews and, and uh, you know, attention that they never had before. We lost the ability to stay in the moment, you know, which is what you have to do to perform. Young walked out on the group just before the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. Stephen asked David Crosby of The Birds to fill in. Crosby was also performing at the festival with the Birds, who were at the height of their success. When Buffalo Springfield split for good, Crosby and Stills decided to team up. And basically, me and Crosby were hanging out. And we went and saw Graham sing with the Hollies. And then Cass comes up and whispers to me, do you think you guys need the harmony singer? Cass Elliott of the Mamas and the Papas introduced David and Stephen to the English pop star Graham Nash. 
Graham had been a member of the Holly since the early 60s. But by 1968, he was beginning to feel the limitations the group was putting on him. In the summer of 1968, Crosby, Stills, and Nash sang together for the first time at a house in Laurel Canyon, belonging to either Cass Elliott or Joni Mitchell. In the summer of 1969, Crosby, Stills, and Nash released their first album to immense critical and commercial acclaim. Then it was time for the group to tour. Stills had overdubbed lead guitar, keyboards, and bass on the album. They would need other musicians to perform the songs on stage. It was Atlantic Records president Ahmed Erdogan who suggested Stephen's former bandmate, Neil Young, would be the perfect addition. Stephen decided that Ahmed was right. David and Graham were not so sure. And I went to breakfast with Neil because I was the one that was mainly against it because I didn't, I didn't see what we needed from Neil. You know, the blend that we had with our voices was uh, pretty good uh, and our musicianship was pretty good. And by the time I'd finished uh, breakfast with Neil, I would have given him the world. He was unbelievably brilliant and of course I loved his music. How are you not going to invite him in? You know, listen to the songs, man. Good Lord. I'd ask him to join the group. Partner was too tempting to resist. Oh, I thought it'd be cool to play with Steven again, and the other guys were great singers and had their own songs and everything. But I, I really felt like I had some unfinished stuff with Steven that we play together, and we, you know, we needed to do more of that. The band officially changed its name to Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young and went to perform their first gig in Chicago. One week later, they had their second performance at Woodstock. Looking at the world through the sunset in your eyes Traveling the train through clear Moroccan skies Ducks and pigs and chickens called This gig had come up and it was a kind of a shaky deal. Nobody was sure what was going to happen. We just knew that some of our favorite bands were going to play there. You know we're riding on the Marrakesh Express. The big nervousness that, that everybody, you know, makes a point of, you know, when Stephen says, Tell them who we are. They don't know what you just saying. Tell them. Yes. The point was that all the people that we really cared about were all standing right behind us. And uh, they had all heard the record, but we'd never played live before. And so they said, okay, well, let's see, can they do it? It's getting to the point where camera set up to shoot the band's historic performance, Neil Young refused to be filmed. I was offended by the cameras all over the place because it was a distraction to what we were doing, which was playing the music. So I told them not to do that with me, that not to film me, don't bother, you know, don't come near me and, uh, you know, stay out of the way. After Woodstock, the band's reputation grew with every show they performed. No respect for the sanctuary and the dressing room. Look at them. <laughs> Within a month after their first gig, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young were superstars. Their performance in New York's Fillmore East created such pandemonium the crowds refused to leave the venue. Concert promoter Bill Graham began stuffing money underneath the dressing room doors until the band returned to the stage. In September, the group went to San Francisco to record an album, but the mood had changed. The band managed to finish their album, but it was a tough time to begin the longest tour any of them had ever been on. Deja Vu was released in March of 1970, at the same time the Beatles broke up. CSNY were rock's new superstars. Their singles Woodstock, Our House, and Teach Your Children were all over radio. 
They were the symbol of peace and love, except between themselves. Well, you know, there was one time in Denver where we had some, some trouble about rehearsals or something, and they had booked a tour, and once again, that never really works for us, because the first day we were rehearsing with a new bass player. Once we got to know the guy and started playing with him, it was great. So there was, there was a big fight around then. We used to fight a lot, sort of like a hockey team, you know? The puck's flying around, the Neil tells this great metaphor about playing hockey. And the team's really clicking and everything, and then all of a sudden, the the gloves are up and they're all fighting, and then they pick them back up and they go back to playing hockey again. It's kind of like that. In May of 1970, the band recorded what would become their most profound political statement, a reaction to the shooting of four Kent State college students at an anti-war rally. I was at this house in, uh, in a canyon on the California coast. Crosby came up and he had the magazine of the Kent State Killings cover on it. And I'd heard it on the news, but Crosby uh, always has a way of bringing things into focus. That's what woke me up to, that there was something going on there that I had some thoughts about. He started writing a song. And when it was done, I called uh, Nash, I think, and said, get the studio, get any studio, get it now. We're on our way. And we cut it, and it was out in a week. Ohio ratified CSNY's position as the voice of the counterculture. Deja Vu was selling in the millions. Their concerts were rallies, rock shows, political events. But Neil was gearing up to restart his solo career with his new album, After the Gold Rush. In July, the CSNY tour ended, and so did the band. They were living legends. They had been together one year. We got together at a certain point in time, and it had a huge effect on a lot of people, including ourselves. And then, uh, but we always planned from the beginning to go off in different directions and do different things, and it just was a loose organization. By the time the live album Four Way Street was released, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young were all making solo. Young's solo music propelled him to the top of the charts. In time, his association with Crosby, Stills & Nash began to seem like a brief side trip in what was always essentially a solo career. All the people that I play with, they all know me that, that I'm moving along and that I may not stay forever and that I might be back. And, you know, as long as everybody knows that from the beginning, it's great to see everybody, and the change is good for music. So real musicians understand that, and they don't uh, worry whether you're playing with them this year or not. I want to live, I want to give, I've been a miner for a heart of gold. In 1971, Neil returned to Toronto. He had played before that time at the riverboat. And I found myself paired with Bernie Fiedler as co-promoters to present Neil Young at Massey Hall, which was going to be Neil's really debut Massey Hall performance. It was really very exciting. It was our first jump uh, as from Neil's solo career, from clubs to main rooms till 3,000 seater. Well, Burton joined the band in 66, and that summer we decided to tour Saskatchewan, and we saw an incredible thing. A girl right out of high school, Joni Mitchell, and she played these incredible songs she had just written. And I remember being so impressed, not, not only by her, her music, which was unique and original, and that's what I liked. I've always liked original. I mean, if you're going to write a song like every other song, why bother? But she had an originality about her, and she also, the way she carried herself, she was very, very beautiful. Stay at home blues. Stay away, stay away, down to the crowds in the street. Night in the city looks pretty to me. 
I think she's one of probably the most unrecognized guitar players in Canada, for sure. She's one of my favorite guitar players. And her jazz sense and all that stuff. I mean, what a sophisticated player. I mean, she's really something. I loved her music, and I had a tape. I guess she gave me a tape. Man, I carried that thing around. I can't tell you how long. And I remember playing it for different managers and hot shots on the business side of uh, the music industry. And Buffy, who I, I was managing then, said, there's a girl named Joni Mitchell playing in town tonight, Elliot. You have got to see her and hear her songs. I literally quit my job and went on the road the next morning, literally the next morning. So I was obviously incredibly moved. I met a redneck on a Grecian Isle who did the goat dance very well. He gave me back my smile, but he kept my camera to sell. Oh, the rogue, the red, red rogue. He cooked good omelettes and stews And I might have stayed on with him there But my heart cried out for you California Oh, California I'm coming home Oh, make me feel good rock and roll band I'm your biggest fan California, I'm coming home When you're walking and the streets are full of strangers, all the news are home, you read, just give you the blues. She was writing incredibly deep lyrical songs that to told stories and wove images and pictures in your head. It's just sort of transporting the people into another world. She takes a lot of specifics, but makes the specifics seem magical. She opened my eyes to music and, in, in specific, songwriting. I remember when I first found Blue and her Case of You, I played it over and over and over and over and over again. I drew a map of Canada, oh, Canada. Your face sketched on twice. Oh, you're in my blood like holy wine. It tastes so bitter and it tastes so sweet. Oh, I could drink a case of you. I think that was the first time I'd heard the word Canada in a piece of music. And um, like I drew a map of Canada, and the way she sang it, it just was like, oh yeah, and it, it was so her story. Everybody who listens to it says the same thing. That's my life, or that that's about me, or that touches, that speaks directly to me. In my deepest, darkest, most depressed moments, that record, from time to time, has been the one that I play. If I had to pick one album to listen to over and over and over again, it would probably be Blue, which I think is one of the five best albums ever made. And still be on my feet. I'd still be on my feet. At the dawn of the decade, folk singers in coffee houses everywhere are stuck in the past. But when America's Bob Dylan writes his anthem, Blowin' in the Wind, everything changes. Suddenly, Canadian folkies like brilliant beat chick Buffy St. Marie and prolific Aurelia heartthrob Gordon Lightfoot start recording their own compositions. But it's a young rodeo buck named Ian Tyson and a small town beauty named Sylvia Fricker joining together to sing about the lonely gulf between lovers in a vast land who will give Canada its unofficial national anthem. I just found that story when Ian Tyson went to New York City, saw this punk named Dylan, never once thought about writing his own song and sat in some office building and wrote Four Strong Winds. I think that is just phenomenal. The reason why Ian and I started to write is because we were hanging out with songwriters in the village. Uh, Bob Dylan, Phil Oakes, I think I'll go out to Alberta Where there's good there in the morning Got some friends that I can go To work in for Still I wish you'd change 
change your mind if I'd ask you one more time. But we've been through that a hundred times or more. For strong winds that blow lonely, seven seas that run high, all those things that don't change come one day, come one day. Their first two albums, as far as I'm concerned, are the amongst the classics of any kind of folk. If it connected with me on some sort of passionate or emotional level, I really didn't care what the label of the music was. My very first song was You Were On My Mind. And I wrote that um, in New York City in 1962. Mind was not immediately popular. It wasn't until it was picked up by the Wii 5 that it really started to get attention. And I can't tell you what a thrill it was to hear it on the radio for the first time. That was quite an experience. A fluke meeting between a trio of Western Canadian folkies and three of Ottawa's plugged in musicians attracts the attention of Cass Elliott of the Mamas and the Papas, who promptly produces their first album. And uh, when they visited Ottawa and they performed at Louis Boo, they connected with David Whiffen and Rick Patterson and eventually a new group that uh, ultimately became six people, really clicked, and I, I ended up co-managing that group with, uh, with Sid Dolgate. One of the singles we put out was a uh, Bruce Coburn song, song called uh, Bird Without Wings. And on the B-side was a uh, Mary McLaughlin song called uh, Coat of Many Colors. down to do our album, uh, we had Whiffen songs, Coburn songs, and the idea of a band that was self-contained that could write songs separated us from the other people. Buffy St. Marie was somebody that I also became aware of through the Greenwich Village folk scene. Bob Dylan had, had seen me at uh, Gertie's Folk City and liked, liked me so much, you ought to go over to the Gaslight. So I went down to the Gaslight and, in, my, in my curvy dress and my high heels. That was a no-no. I was writing things like uh, Universal Soldier, uh, Until It's Time For You To Go, uh, Now That The Buffalo's Gone. Well, listen to me if you care where we stand and you feel you're a part of these ones. Nobody was shining a spotlight on Native issues at that time. Nobody. She is really who set the stage for Aboriginal artists. She really jumped out of the groove. She had a sense of who she was just from listening to those records. Well, her words and stuff like that are just... She's just an amazing talent and an amazing woman. He's the one who must decide who's to live and who's to die. And he never sees the writing in some ways, Lightfoot defined the Canadian folk scene. When he appeared on the scene in the 60s, it was different somehow. Lightfoot coming out of small town Canada and sounding like it, but being really good. You can't jump a jet plane like you can a freight train. I mean, it takes the singing hobo into the next era. You know, it goes from the dirty 30s troubadour kind of thing into the, you know, the jet age. Well, it's been recorded by a lot of people and, uh, uh, First, of course, by Ian and Sylvie, but eventually uh, Dylan took a shot at it and did it really good. And, uh, and Elvis, uh, as a, I think, is a wonderful version of it. As I've written more songs myself, I can see the real craft in them. And those recordings of those early songs are really amazing. Beautiful voice, don't you think? I mean, so unique. He has a naturalist aspect to him, you know? Um, it's kind of like the Emily Carr of Canadian songwriting, if you will. Canadian Railroad Trilogy is absolutely one of the most beautiful, 
perfect songs ever written. It's dramatic, it's melodic, it's just fantastic. Long before the white man and long before the wheel When the green dark forest was too silent to be real But time has no beginnings and the history has no bounds as to this verdant country, they came from all around. They sailed upon her waterways and they walked the forest tall. Built the mines, mills, and the factories for the good of us all. We were in Montreal, courtesy of the record label, promoting something. And the record promotion guy took us to a little coffee house. There were about 50 of us in the audience. And Gordon came out and did an entire 60-minute set of original material. And Randy and I kept nudging each other in the ribs and saying, someday that'll be us. Gordon Lightfoot was a great role model for me because I had such tremendous pressure to move to the U.S. And I saw what he did. I mean, he, he stayed here. And he's not a myth. He's a reality. And he's a very interesting reality. If you could read my mind, love, what a tale my thoughts could tell. Just like an old time movie about a ghost from a wishing well in a castle dark or a fortress strong with chains upon my feet. You know that ghost is me, and I would never be set free as long as I'm a ghost. That you can't see If I could read your mind, love What a tell your thoughts could tell and Just like a paperback novel The kind that the drugstore sells When you reach the part Where the heartaches come The hero would be me But hero often fail and you won't read that book again because the ending's just too hard to take Among Canadian folkies Gordon Lightfoot inspires a generation with his deeply personal songs. I mean obviously he wrote a lot of his great you know classics in the 60s the early morning rains and that but in terms of his voice at the time that I was working on it that uh, I could feel some potential there. And we felt the same thing too and we recorded the song, uh, that it might be a single, and it actually was. You know, for some reason, that sort of, whatever that Canadian thing is, makes people write better songs. I remember when the record was being made, it was only then that sort of struck me just how brilliant Bruce was because, you know, I'd, I'd kind of signed him a little bit on the basis of going to the country and uh, musical friends. But it really, at the heart of that, even that first album, were things that sounded like nobody else. The closer we get, the easier life becomes for each of us. We can sing songs and play at each other over wine. In pipes, and we can pass on endings till the end. We can laugh, me and my musical friends. I yearn so much to write that way, you know, uh, to to paint the, the the pictures and the images you see in your mind, the, the feelings you have for people, to put them down in words and to share them. Bruce Coburn and I 
really started around the same time. And I've recorded a couple of his songs and have admired him greatly as a writer. And few the ones with help to lend within the world of men. One Day I Walk came a little later. Uh, I loved that. It was sort of a gospel kind of song, and I was a sucker for a gospel song. It's just what he does for a living. You know, it's not a big deal. It just does it, and he will do it until he decides not to. Coburn I love too is that he's also an amazing musician. I, I mean seeing him play is pretty devastating. Watching that guy play guitar it's like he's got four hands. But the way he plays is such a part of his songs. Valdi springs out of the fertile west coast like a towering redwood to become one of the country's top folkies with idealistic songs about peace and contentment. Paradoxically, while singing about the simple life, Valdi and his hometown band used then state-of-the-art technology to make one of Canada's very first music videos. Play Me a Rock and Roll song had been very well produced. Claire Lawrence, in my case, was the producer, and a brilliant producer. And he managed to, uh, to take something from that song and make it accessible. And I love that song. I love the humor. I love the wryness. And I love the way he sang. I played them some songs about peace and contentment, the things that I've come to believe in. When I was through to a chorus of boom, some track story on thank God he's leaving. Now someone played me a rock and roll song. Because of the CanCon, because it was a good rock waltz, these elements combined to make it uh, easier for me to get that song played. And it was a major success right across the country and in Potsdam, New York. I think it's just a realness to him. You know, I believe it was, uh, I believed him when he sang to me. And he, he wrote, uh, he was a message orientated songwriter. He's up on stage and he's never pretending to be anything else than what he is. And it's endearing. Urban life in Canada is captured in all its rugged glory by folk singer Murray McLaughlin. A suburban teenage runaway with a shoulder bag full of songs is chomping at the bit. Murray comes running behind me one day and he says, you know, you, you got, you know, I hear you started a record company. You've got to sign me. He said, I'm going to make you a million dollars. He said, look, if you want to, if you're serious about wanting to do this, get the hell out of here. So Murray did that, uh, and he went to New York. Tom Rush recorded a few of his songs. You know, Murray's own career is still not really going. Murray gets a gig at the riverboat, and I go see him. And, you know, Murray's playing these songs, like Child Song and Honky Red and 16 Lanes of Highway. And How lucky can I be? I send this guy away a year ago, and now here he's back. Murray McLaughlin. I remember when Bernie bought me a demo of Murray's, and he played it in my hotel room for Joni and I. I mean, but there was just this wealth of really fine young songwriters. Too much sugar in my bowl, my cup it overflows. Empty headed strangers read me empty headed prose. I have to hide myself inside when I come into heat. And in my it's time to be back on the street. Murray 
has set the stage for artists like the Tragically Hip and Rio Statics and so on, who really try and paint a broader Canadian picture as well as using their own Toronto viewpoint. When I need a drink, I'm Down near half a ton In a furnished room In a Joyceville pen I got me a no good son Murray McLaughlin was one of the songwriters Who held Toronto up To itself I said look, look at what you really are And one of the first Urban folk singers I got a call from Murray because Bruce Coburn was, was Supposed to play mandolin on Down by the Henry Moore But he said can you come in after your gig tonight and come on down to Thunder Sound? It was a thrilling session and it was really fun. And then Henry Moore became a hit. I went to the silver dollar, looked a stranger in the eye. A friend of mine says sir, he don't think this town so out of sight. But he's got shades all around his soul. first actual gig we ever did was at Maple Leaf Garden. But Gordon Lightfoot had decided to do a benefit for the Canadian Olympic team. We got Murray McLaughlin, we got Sylvia Tice, we got Leon Ona Boyd and myself, and we had a real tight little show. And I think, you know, Gordon was expecting something a little quieter. But the place, you know, went nuts, and it made a lot of, it got a lot of press. And uh, they ate me alive that day, and I'm glad they did. They helped us do a great show. Don't you want to get undone? Don't you want to change from losing? Don't you want to have some... Murray had, down by the Henry Moore, and just this remarkable sequence of great, great songs that go on radio. Back in the mid-70s, we used to perform at a coffee house in London called Smales Pace. And uh, there were a lot of great artists came in there at that time, people like uh, Willie P. Bennett and Colleen Peterson and Stan Rogers. Two sisters from tiny Saint-Sauveur, northwest of Montreal, forge a unique, beguiling sound based on traditional folk and parlor music. Their songs become hits for singers like Emmy Lou Harris and Linda Ronstadt. The McGarrigals are soon the darlings of the British and American scenes. I think Kate and Anna McGarrigal are just unique. They have a, you hear them and you know who it is. The great spirit of music fell on their heads when they were young and, and thank God for us. What the McGarrigal family did in the evening was sit around the piano and sing. They, they really reintroduced folk music and folk songs, but also created songs that were timeless. And I remember the songs that they wrote for Linda Ronstadt, Art Like a Wheel. We worship them. Me. I've been lucky enough to do some shows with them and watch them from the side of the stage. And when they sing together, it's really special. Uh, it gives you chills. The first record is, is viewed now as this classic because the songs and the singing was so fantastic. I don't think I've ever had a better time making a record. Susan James of the Stormy Clovers. She really had a vision, and so it would be natural that she would be drawn to Leonard. They were doing Leonard Cohen material. That's the first time I ever heard Suzanne. Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. thing was that we couldn't get the world to understand the talents of the Stormy Clovers.
I always remember the line about the oranges. It really stuck. Like, even as an eight-year-old kid, it's like the power of poetry came through in that song. Mary offered me the job of arranging or producing Leonard Cohen's for sale. I think she played me a couple of demo tapes of just Leonard playing solo guitar and singing, and I said, I don't know what to do with this. And so I, and I passed. God almighty, that album sold like three million copies or something like that. It was a huge sale in those days. The most dignified guy in the pantheon of Canadian songwriters is Leonard Cohen. And, it, and if you remember his, his induction into the Hall of Fame, where he just read the Tower of Song. And that was, I mean, we all knew it. And still it was so moving. You know, it was just such a, it was such an incredible depiction of what it's like to be a songwriter. My friends are gone and my hair is gray and I ache in the places where I used to play and I'm hungry for love, but I'm not coming on. I'm just paying my rent every day in the Tower of Song. Like a drunk in a midnight choir I have tried in my way to be free But I Leonard Cohen will I'll always hope, just pray that someday I'll be able to pen a lyric that in some ways will live anywhere near that galaxy. He represents something so truly bohemian to me that I, I adore. I uh, always thought of myself as a singer and uh, kind of got sidetracked into literature. Can you sing? Well, I think that if the song is really good and it's your own, then uh, what comes out is music. I mean, I think it's always been a, a given that he is an amazing wordsmith. Um, but when you hear other people do his songs, you realize what a tuneful songwriter he is as well. He, when he does his songs, I, I think he's incredibly tuneful. You know, I think a lot of people have got to come to his singing style, and, and some people do and some people don't, but I, I, I love the characteristic that is his singing voice. Now Suzanne takes your hand She leads you to the river Ah, oh, she's wearing rags and feathers From Salvation Army counters And the sun pours down like honey As in the 60s, singer-songwriters remain a big part of Canadian music. But now, these artists are lending their lyrics to a diverse range of music, including rock, reggae, Celtic jigs, and jazz. Canada's unofficial poet laureate records two albums in the 80s and scores a huge comeback after the release of various positions. And it, it was cool again, too. I mean, it was always cool to be Leonard Cohen, but in, in, in terms of the industry, it was cool to be Leonard Cohen. He just has that class to him and... and Obviously, the way with words. I had that album and I loved it and I was trying to turn people onto it and and uh, I remember hearing this Leonard Cohen interview that he couldn't get that album released in the States and uh, he was vindicated with I'm Your Man because that was a huge record. If you want a partner, take my hand or if you want to strike me down in anger, here I stand. I'm your man. Joni Mitchell, who ventured into jazz pop with Court and Spark, delves even deeper into jazz with the astonishing Hijira. 
I felt that Joni Mitchell's songs were going deeper. Uh, they just seemed so astonishingly real, yet at the same time, not easily duplicated because her use of language and her, her use of chords which were, uh, were somewhat un unconventional. My two favorite Joni Mitchell albums are Blue and Hey Jira. Those two albums stand out for me in their simplicity and the sound of her voice with Jacob Pastorius' bass playing that, that's all over Hey Jira. It's just gorgeous. Maybe I've never really loved. I guess that is the truth. I've spent my whole life in clouds and I see altitudes and looking down on everything I crashed into his eyes a million it was just a false alarm Joni Mitchell has been hugely influential for her contemporaries. The fact that she was willing to follow her desires shows that she's very dedicated to her own vision rather than what, how other people see her. After winning fame with several albums that establish her as the queen of confessional folk, Joni Mitchell takes an adventurous left turn and attracts a new devoted following with her jazz pop sound. The musicality that kept developing in the records that came after Blue were really, really amazing. The seminal record would be uh, Court and Spark, if I was to have a top five list. I remember all the band, we were rehearsing and all that, and somebody said, oh, I saw a Joni Mitchell album just came out. Everybody went, slack, got the copy, uh, put some speakers on the floor, lie down, and just uh, go for a couple of days. You know, just like, oh, God. I think the thing about Joni Mitchell is just, at the end of the day, her voice. She's a very pure voice, and as a younger person, I would hear this person's voice and wonder who this person was. What I respect most about her is that she can do jazz like a jazz singer. Joni's gained an enormous respect in the, in the jazz community. <laughs> they accepted her as one of them. It's brilliant stuff. And it's just, a, it's just a growth thing with her. She's just always moving artistically. She's the real deal.